The crew of Turkish Airlines Flight 1951 got warnings to extend their landing gear while still thousands of feet in the air. On the initial listen, we heard a gear warning horn occur as the aircraft was approaching, when it was still up at, and it was coming in at about 10,000 feet and below. Investigators now turn to the flight data recorder to help solve some of the mystery surrounding this flight. The analysis of wind speeds outside the aircraft is completed. It's clear, none are drastic enough to have brought down the plane. Evidence of a microburst. But the flight data recorder does provide some valuable insight into the cause of the landing gear warning. One of the instruments that measures altitude had the plane already on the ground. When we looked and saw the radio altimeter data on the recorder, it showed about 8,000 feet, and then immediately it went down to about minus 8. Minus 8 feet is an indication that the aircraft's on the ground, but of course it's still at 2,000 feet. The Boeing 737 is equipped with two separate altimeters. One measures air pressure to determine the plane's height above sea level. That reading is displayed prominently in the cockpit on both pilots' flight display. Zero. Set, sir. The plane is also equipped with a radio altimeter. It's made up of four antennas. Two transmit signals to the ground, and two others read the signal that bounces back to determine the plane's height. It's precise. It's very, very precise. Pressure altimeters can sometimes be not as accurate, and radar altimeters are 100% accurate if they're working properly. One antenna feeds the reading to the first officer's display. The other feeds the captain's instruments. In the case of flight 1951, the captain's side was wrong most of the flight. Investigators go back over the CVR and make a puzzling discovery. Amsterdam, Turkish 1951, descending to 7,000, speed 250. Radio Captain Arasan seems to have known that the landing gear warning was being caused by a faulty radio altimeter. The airplane thought that it was low to the ground and the gear was not down. And the captain recognized that the problem was really in the radio altimeter, showing him that they should be on the ground. And he goes, it's just the radio altimeter. Throughout much of the approach, the captain's radio altimeter had been displaying a reading of minus eight feet, triggering the warning to lower the gear. They treated it like it was a nuisance. Turkish 1951. Descend to 2000. 2000. 1951. Investigators dig for any other abnormalities. They learn that with flight 1951 still about 17 kilometers from the airport, controllers directed the pilots to begin their final turn to line up with the runway. Turkish, 1951, left heading. 210, clear approach. 18, right. Left 210, clear ILS, Turkish, 1951. 210, set, sir. This turn puts flight 1951 in line with runway 18 right. It's equipped with an instrument landing system, which sends out a signal outlining the ideal descent path to the foot of the runway. The autopilot follows that glide path until the plane is a few hundred feet from the ground. Then the pilot takes over. It makes landing almost effortless. The ILS is pretty easy to follow. It's a video game. My daughter has uh, flown in a simulator and, and can land a 737 uh, using the ILS. The crew begins configuring their plane for landing, unfazed by the warning horn that's repeatedly triggered by the malfunctioning radio altimeter. Flaps 15. 10 kilometers out, flight 1951 picks up the ILS signal that will guide the plane to the runway. Localizer arrive. Localizer capture. The safety pilot, Olgai Ozgur, now reminds Captain Arasan about the failed altimeter. We have radio altimeter failure, sir. Okay. Turkish, 1951. 
Runway 18 right. Clear to land. Clear to land. Thank you. Investigators are stumped. The crew knew about the malfunction and continued their approach. How had it then caused them to crash? Clearly, there was more to this accident than a faulty altimeter. The whole premise of airline safety, uh, the way we build the airplanes, the way we fly them, is based on the idea that we can have any number of failures and we should still be able to arrive safely. The radio altimeter is just one instrument. There's no way in the world that that one instrument, if it fails, should uh, be a, a major cause of worry that we're going to have a crash. Investigators wonder if the crew had been given proper guidance for their approach. They turn to exchanges between the pilots and the controller who guided them in. They carefully review every instruction. Turkish 1951, descend to 4000. Speed OK for ILS 18, right. Turkish 1951, descend to 2000. Turkish 1951, left heading 210, clear approach, 18 right. By following the controller's instructions, the crew made their final turn much too close to the runway. So they intercept properly, they should be here. International guidelines call for approaching planes to intercept the signal that guides them to the runway from below. It's so pilots don't have to make any drastic last-minute course corrections to get to it. The intercept here, they had to descend. But Flight 1951 was given instructions that brought it to the threshold of the glide slope while still way above it. It's a common practice at Schiphol because it gets planes to the runway faster. Because they were so close, they had to capture the glide slope from above. Although it is an unusual situation, it is one that, that can be handled by a flight crew if it is managed properly. Approaching a glide slope from above is more difficult, mostly because the crew has to suddenly slow the plane and descend rapidly to intercept the signal. We also call this a slam dunk approach. And some pilots like it, some pilots don't. It's a little bit harder, and things happen quicker when you're above the glide path trying to intercept from, ab from above. And it's just a challenge for a lot of pilots. The approach from above increased the crew's workload, but it's standard practice at Schiphol Airport. Uh, I've flown into Schiphol dozens of times, and I expect it. If the controller's instructions had somehow overtaxed this crew, their conversations would indicate it. They're just five kilometers from the runway. Thousand. Check. Flaps 40. Speed brake. Speed brake armed. Green light. One thing at a time. Landing gear. Gear down. Three green. Flaps. Flaps 40. Green light. 500. All lights on. Please warn the cabin crew. Cabin crew, take your seats. Then, real trouble. A stall warning. Speed, sir. I have control. 100 knots of speed. Arisan forced to save his plane, but just 400 feet above the ground at only one and a half kilometers from the runway, the Boeing 737 suddenly fell straight down. It only took a few seconds for it to hit the ground. Turkish 1951. The recording sheds light on the final minutes of the flight. The crew was configuring their plane for landing well after it should have been done. Flaps. Flaps 40. Green light. Most airlines have regulations that call for a flight to be stabilized, to have all checklists completed by the time the plane hits 1,000 feet. In instrument conditions, uh, you're required at 1,000 feet to have basically everything done. The airplane is configured, you have slowed, you have run your before landing check, and you have received your landing clearance. And from 1,000 feet on in, you just monitor the instruments and we're looking for the runway. Please warn the cabin crew. In fact, this crew was still running their checklist up to the moment the crisis hit. 460 feet above the ground. 
This approach was not stabilized. Because the aircraft was unstable, the flight crew was in a very high workload environment in the last thousand feet of flight. The radio altimeter was malfunctioning. The aircraft was giving off warnings. The crew was assigned a challenging approach, and they were executing a checklist late. But none of this explains why Flight 1951 crashed. In these type of accidents, you can never get inside the head of the pilots. And that's a very frustrating type of accident. But the flight data recorder does provide another intriguing clue. Moments before Flight 1951 hit the ground, the plane's engines were at idle, hardly providing any power. Perhaps this accident is a repeat of the Heathrow incident. The engines, it was interesting to note, were at idle approximately the last two minutes of the flight until the very end when the thrust uh, was increased again. That was a big red flag right there. The question is, is why was that the case? But then they spot something that's very different from the accident at Heathrow. Retired flare mode. For some reason, while still more than a thousand feet above the ground, the plane's computer began preparing to touch down. In retard flare mode, engine power is reduced to idle by the flight computer. And the plane's nose automatically pitches up to the flare position. Planes should only be in this configuration just before they touch the ground. The autopilot raises the nose to break the descent. The autothrottles brings the power back to flight idle. And you touch down with the power either all the way in idle or just about to be in idle. But Flight 1951 went into a slow, nose-up position well before touchdown, causing the plane to fly slower and slower throughout its descent. So why was Flight 1951 in landing mode? And why hadn't any of the three crew members noticed how slowly they were flying? So, what else was going on when the engines went to idle? The trouble seems to start with the malfunctioning altimeter. We had to look at the system as a whole and see how that minus eight affected the other systems on the aircraft. And that was a very big portion of this investigation. We had to say, how did the autopilot use that data? More importantly, how did the auto throttle use that data? The computer that flies the plane consists of two main systems the autopilot and the auto throttle. The auto throttle determines how much power to ask the engines for, while the autopilot controls the plane's altitude and direction. The two systems work independently of each other, and only one of the radio altimeters provides information to the auto throttle. In this case, I had to learn everything there was about radio altimeters and auto throttle systems, which I didn't know before. The pieces of the puzzle begin coming together when they find the connection between the faulty radio altimeter and engine power. The radio altimeter provides information to the autothrottle from the captain's side. 